Well, uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, uh, to the NM NDSR's online uh, a platform. Uh, my name is Marcio Aranha, and I am professor in the UNB School of Law uh, and dean of the Research Center on Communications Policy, Law, Economics, and Technology at UNB. I'm also the executive director of the UNB Center on Law and Regulation, which is hosting today's lecture. Uh, today's lecture celebrates the 200 lectures of the NDSR seminars on law and regulation. It really gives, a, gives me a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker and discussant today, Professor Robert Baldwin. Uh, he is an emeritus professor of law at LLC. He has written numerous books and learned articles on regulation, including the most widely used academic volume on regulation in the UK, Understanding Regulation. He has advised numerous corporations, international bodies, um, government departments and agencies on regulation and is a member of the national audit officers offices panel of regulatory experts uh, he led the team that wrote the scoping study report for the government's review of legal services regulation as well as the team that wrote the DIFRA review of enforcement on 2005 2006. Uh, a few words about the format before we get started. Professor Baldwin uh, will present the most anticipated lecture on positive regulation. We will then open it up to all of you. We have plenty of time of questioning, so please uh, don't be shy to send your question via the Q&A function on Zoom. And I will do my level best to put as many as them as possible to Professor Baldwin during the discussion period. Uh, so normally at this point in the opening, I would ask all of you to put your hands together and give uh, our speaker one of those warm UNB welcomes that of course not possible today. In lieu of applause, I encourage you to pose questions in the Q&A period. Uh, Professor Balding, welcome to the NDSR online platform. It's great to have you with us, and we very much appreciate your willingness to do so. Uh, talking about this most anticipated topic on positive regulation, Professor Balding had recently launched a new book. Uh, let me do the introduction to the uh, and Taming the Corporation, How to Regulate for Success with Martin Cave, which is a delightful reading with interesting side, uh, case, case in points, cases in point, and uh, uh, it is really a delightful reading. So Professor Baldwin, the platform is yours. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Marcia, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for those kind words of introduction. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for coming into virtual attendance here. It's very kind of you. I look forward to the time when I can um, revisit your beautiful country and uh, both our countries resume normal life. Now, today I'm going to talk about the idea of positive regulation uh, which Martin and I talk about in the, the new book, Taming the Corporation. Um, so I'll start off by saying, why should we be generally positive about regulation? And then I will move on to our concept of how to regulate positively. Um, so first of all, uh, why be positive about regulation? Now, it, it's a particular bugbear of mine that many commentators and politicians talk as if regulation was some sort of necessary evil or even unnecessary evil. Um, but it, it, it seems to me and others that there are a number of reasons why we should have a positive rather than a negative view of regulatory activity. <laughs> Businesses and uh, the people of a country need regulation. And there are six or seven good reasons why businesses need regulation. 
Um, firstly, you need regulation to create and sustain many markets. If you take the market uh, for spectrum rights for mobile mobile telephones, that that is a market that is created by regulation. It's regulators that divide the spectrum up and create the rights that allow that to be those uh, spectrum rights to be bought and sold. So regulation actually holds the market in place. Uh, it's not some nasty side effect of the market. It's intrinsic to that market. Second reason, uh, consumer or investor confidence. Um, many people invest in pension plans. You, know, you would not invest in a pension plan unless you thought that uh, the finances involved were regulated properly by uh, a financial services regulator, because you want to know at the end of the day, after, after having invested all this money, that you will get your pension at the end of it. So, so you need regulation to create consumer confidence. You, know, you, don't, you wouldn't buy so many toys for your children unless you knew that these toys were safe. Um, thirdly, businesses gain assurance of fair treatment from regulation. So there's a picture here I hope you can see of a, a railway line. Well, if you are a railway company ro running rolling stock and you want to do so on that railway line, you will want to know that you will be charged a fair rate for putting your stock on that line. And that once you have committed to that project, the price won't simply escalate beyond your control. So you will want to know that there is some sort of price control mechanism operated by a regulator that means that you can invest in rolling stock. So before you invest, again, you want to know that there is a decent system of regulation. It's regulation actually enables business activity. The uh, fourth example is slightly different. Um, the picture here is of a digital radio. Now, in many countries around the world, there was a move from analog to digital that was managed not by a bundle of small companies, but by the central regulator. It was the regulator that was best placed to move radio or television broadcasting into the digital age. So actually, the regulator is involved in planning and affecting change within certain industries. So again, you need regulation. Um, international competitiveness. You, know, you wouldn't invest in a Brazilian operation in a sector if you thought that you were going to be undercut by operators from other countries operating at lower, cheaper standards than you. So you want to know that there is a system that will regulate the evenness of the competition you face from those competitors. Uh, research and development and innovation. Well, because the point here is that if you're a pharmaceutical company and you invest $20 million in researching a new drug and developing it, you have, you to, have get to get that get $20 that million dollars back. back. The only way you can get that money back is by a regulatory system that gives you a protection in the marketplace that allows you to recover those costs of R&D. So without regulation, pharmaceutical companies would not do the research and development to produce new, new drugs. So it is having a system of regulation that allows the development of new pharmaceuticals. Uh, and final point I'll make is that um, you need regulation to balance business and social interest. The picture here is of a, of a steel foundry. Well, clearly we need regulations to balance the business interest in making steel with the safety of the workers involved there. Anyway, so for that at least half a dozen reasons, we need regulation to make business happen. And that, that's one or half a dozen reasons why we should have a very positive attitude towards regulatory activity. Now, that's general. I'm now going to talk about the concept of positive regulation. Um, and I think there are two planks to this concept. Uh, as we see it, positive regulation involves a predisposition, which is 
to harness firms' self-regulatory capacities. That is, it's a predisposition only to regulate when you have to. And it's a call to minimal regulation. And one of the principal ways to get minimal regulation is to allow self-regulation insofar as you can trust companies to self-regulate, which we'll come back to. Um, and the second element of positive regulation is when delivering regulation, when you have to regulate, then you should do so in the best way possible. And I'm going to suggest to you that the best regulators tend to be those that are aware, intelligent and dynamic in discharging the tasks of regulation. And I'll explain in a minute what I mean by that. OK, but to start then, uh, uh, harnessing firms self-regulatory capacities. Um, let's talk about that. Now, it seems to us that if you are going to rely on self-regulation to the maximum extent, the first thing you would do would be to look for the opportunities for win-win. That is where regulators and the regulated parties can both gain from regulation. So these are the real win situations, in which case you have very few problems, but the key is to be able to identify opportunities for win-win. Uh, now, you can't always get a win-win outcome, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, and the second thing you have to do to, to harness self-regulatory capacities is to tailor your strategy to the target. That is to make sure that the way you regulate and the degree to which you trust the regulated firms uh, is a function of the kinds of people or firm you are dealing with. And I'll talk about that. But we'll start off by, by just having a look at win-win. Clearly, this is a first resort. If you can get win-win, then everybody comes out ahead. Um, now, this is Michael Porter. Uh, we're familiar, no doubt, with the Porter hypothesis uh, on win-win. Now, Porter argues that, firstly, and he's talking about environmental regulation, but we can extend this thesis to regulation generally. Uh, regulation can lead to innovation. So regulators can stimulate firms to innovate in their production processes. That's the weak version. The strong, more interesting version of the Porter thesis is when regulators drive innovation, those innovations often offs offset costs. They're compensatory. Uh, notably by increasing competitiveness. Okay, so, that, so when firms are encouraged or stimulated to innovate, the costs of innovation are often compensated by those very innovations themselves. That's the strong win-win concept. Everybody comes out ahead. So why would regulation produce positive effects? And there are a number of examples of this. Firstly, regulators can signal to companies potential innovations or new, new efficiencies. So the regulators with their expertise can go to firms and point out to them, look, there are new technologies here. You can clean up your waste far more efficiently and, and uh, more cheaply if you do this. So, where the regulator stimulates that kind of innovation, then people come out ahead. They actually lower their costs and come into line with the regulator's requirements. Um, secondly, regulators can promote progress by countering managerial inertia. Sometimes managers are driven by quite short-term incentives, e.g. to maximize short-term returns in order to maximize their own bonuses. So they will stick with existing technologies, they will underinvest in new technologies, and that will serve their personal managerial interests. Um, so that kind of short-termism can be countered by regulators who will say, 
no, no, you've got to move away from that way of doing things and you've got to innovate by uh, reducing your effluents in this way or using new technologies. Regulation can foster industrial coordination and interoperability. So you can get uh, all the railway operators to use the same gauge of line or the same signaling systems or platforms at the same height. Uh, and that is a big centrally imposed efficiency that comes from the regulator. Regulators create consumer or investor confidence as we've talked about before. Um, so where people know that financial products are reliable, they will tend to buy. Regulation can protect from undercutting or a race to the bottom. So there is no point in me as a food producer operating to, let's say, high animal welfare standards if other people will not do so and they will undercut me. Regulation is what is a thing that protects me from being undercut in a race to the bottom on standards. If I want to invest in better systems, perhaps uh, more humane methods of pig production, let's say, then the uncertainty of those investments is reduced by regulation, which demands that everybody increases their standards of welfare. Um, and if there are big changes to be imposed on an industry, then you can level the playing field with regulation so that people who come into compliance quickly are not undercut in the market by other firms. So for all of these reasons, regulation can bring advantages. There are, why are there offsetting gains for firms? Why, if you're a regulated company and you have to spend money on coming into compliance, then why might you achieve some compensation some compensating gain? And the answer is regulation can prompt new efficiencies, lower compliance costs, or bring first mover advantages. So for instance, um, where a regulator points out a new cleanup technology, that might actually be more efficient and lower costs for the company. Um, so the regulator can improve products and processes, um, it can, they can suggest how the byproducts of a process can be used or resold in the marketplace in a sort of circular economy structure. Uh, lower waste disposal costs might be produced, for instance. So regulation can actually produce gains uh, where companies are producing better systems. Um, investment is encouraged, as we said before, and the threats of undercutting in the marketplace by poor, cheap operators is reduced because poor, cheap, non-compliant operations are prohibited by regulators. Um, and then finally, of course, good regulation can produce consumer rewards. Buyers will value virtuous products. You know, this woman will buy more eggs if they are produced free range, she'll buy more pharmaceutical products if she thinks that they are produced safely to good safety standards. Uh, so, so consumers will actually reward compliant operators and regulation creates confidence that will bring those rewards. So these are all compensations for coming into compliance. However, we have to be aware that there are limits of win-win. Um, firstly, there are circumstances in which the costs of being regulated can actually chill investment, chill production and innovation. Uh, and we have to be aware that it is not always the case that there are these compensating gains that come from regulation. Um, innovation, of course, may not always happen. There may not be a new technology available. In certain industries, there are a host of new technologies that can be bought off the shelf. In others, that is simply not the case. Um, second point is that regulatory costs may hinder, may hinder small firms and startups. And in some sectors, 
real innovation will come from the arrival of startups. So if real innovation is produced by startup firms, the problem is that regulatory costs always tend to hit startups harder than incumbents. And so regulation may discourage innovation that comes through small new firms. And fourth point here is that regulation may involve a certain element of capture. That is, current technologies and practices may actually be enshrined by regulatory systems. You know, they become the protected ways of doing things. And that produces quite a conservative approach to production. And that's quite anti-innovation if there is an element of capture within the system. If regulators are to stimulate innovation, of course, this assumes that the regulators will be able to identify innovative opportunities. Yet regulators may not be well placed to identify those cutting edge innovations. Uh, and finally, regulators may focus on minimizing the risks from current processes, but change may demand radical innovations from new arrivals on the scene, such as we know, all know how Uber completely revolutionized uh, the taxi industry. But just to repeat this point, the danger is that if you engage in risk-based regulation, the way of least resistance for a regulator is to analyze current risks from current operations. And the effect of that may be to blind the regulator to the possibilities that actually new systems, processes, and technologies may produce a, a better risk profile than the current regime. Like the currently identified risks sometimes become the, the Linus blanket uh, held onto by the regulators. Will companies respond to regulatory drivers, i.e. to regulatory pressures that drive them towards innovation? The problem here is that low capacity firms, those with low levels of expertise, tend not to respond well to regulation. And actually, they are probably causing, they're likely to be causing most of the problems for most regulators. You know, this is the regulatory paradox, that the people most likely to respond badly to regulation or not respond at all will tend to be the people creating most problems. Uh, and high capacity firms, in turn, they may have used their resources and high capacity to capture the regime, to turn it into some sort of cozy arrangement for the current method of production. So uh, they may not respond very well either to stimulations to change. So we can't assume that all, reg all regulated companies will respond well to the incentive to innovate that regulators impose. So what are the messages of win-win theory for regulatory design? Well, clearly, we should aim for win-win whenever possible, because everybody comes out ahead. We should facilitate innovation with flexible instruments. That is, we should allow companies maximum flexibility to develop their own newer, better systems. And I'll come back to flexible instruments in a minute. We should try and avoid locking in technologies. You know, one of the problems with regulations that demand the use of a specific technology is that it locks that technology in. It's not open to the use of a new, better, cleaner technology. You should reduce the uncertainties and transition costs of moving to new regulatory systems. And we should assist, educate, and train as well as penalize. If we're going to regulate in a manner that encourages innovation, then we should spend as much time thinking about helping and educating companies as simply penalizing them, which is a rather negative attitude to regulation. Okay, so that's that's win-win. We should look for win-win where we can, but we must be aware that win-win possibilities 
are not always there for a number of reasons. Now, the second element of the disposition in positive regulation is to, to tailor the strategy to the target, to maximize the degree we can work with, re with regulated companies. So we need to harness firms' self-regulated capacities, and to do that, we need to identify the degree to which different firms can be trusted to perform well. We should only use intrusive or costly regulation where necessary. Now, clearly, to use regulation positively and in a minimal way, then we have to allow companies to self-regulate where that's possible and feasible uh, and only use costly regulation when we really have to. And then, as I said before, we should enable rather than restrict. We should tend to use the least intrusive regulation uh, that we can get away with. Um, what do I mean then by enabling rather than restricting? Well, here are, here are two lists of intervention methods or regulatory methods. So enabling systems are things like incentives, self-monitoring processes, use of principles rather than bright line rules, uh, processes for negotiating outcomes, for informing firms and educating them and allowing them to self-regulate. So these are all, they all tend to be quite cheap regulatory systems um, and they are low intrusion and they allow firms to do their own thing. More restrictive types of regulation tend to use prohibitions, external inspections, detailed rules, prosecutions, sanctions, state regulation rather than self-regulation. And these methods tend to be more expensive for the regulators in the state and more intrusive. Um, now, of course, as we'll see in a minute, sometimes you have to use restrictive systems, uh, but the key to positive regulation is only to use the most expensive restrictive systems where you really have to. Uh, and a key to deciding or identifying the degree to which you can rely on companies to self-regulate and the degree to which you need to use more restrictive regimes is to understand the kinds of company you're dealing with. Uh, so I'm going to suggest to you here, we can distinguish quite usefully, I think, between four different models of company that tend to be regulated. Uh, so in this picture here, we see uh, a good company, this is the best kind of company, they are well-intentioned, they believe in compliance, um, and they're high capacity. So with these people, they're pretty easy to regulate, they're friendly to regulators, and they're cooperative. So you know, these are quite good to deal with as a regulator. This person here is well-intentioned, he believes in compliance. He believes that regulation is generally a good thing. It's just that he's not very good at paperwork. He doesn't know all the rules. So he would rank as low capacity in this analysis. Um, so he's not familiar with all of the things he has to do. This is the sort of person who, who waits for the regulator to tell him or her what to do, and then will sort of generally have a pretty good effort at doing it might not always succeed, but they'll have a, a reasonably well-intentioned uh, attempt to come into compliance. But they're generally fairly low capacity. The third group are the ill-intentioned high capacity. They're ill-intentioned because they don't really believe in the objectives of regulation. They believe in making money for themselves and their shareholders. And they are high capacity. They are amoral calculators. They are good at making money and their, their thoughts are always about how they can turn regulation to their advantage. Um, and they are, these people are difficult to regulate because they're, they're cunning, uh, but they're not well-intentioned. And the fourth category are ill-intentioned, low-capacity operators. 
These people don't like regulation. They don't like regulators. They're low capacity. They don't actually know what the regulations demand they do. Uh, so they're a nightmare for regulators. These are often the people that regulators uh, have to put out of business. You, know, you would not want this person uh, running a nuclear power station or an airline. Okay, so you'll see here that on this page, you can have a breakdown of these four different profiles of company based on their attitude and their ability. R running from well-intentioned high capacity down to ill-intentioned low capacity. Now, uh, on the right-hand side of the page, you'll see I've just suggested some useful intervention tools that relate to these different types of operator. So with the very best people in this group number one, you can allow them to self-monitor you can have principle-based regulation. You can give them advice and information. You can have dialogues with them. And generally, they will behave well and you'll get a good result. With well-intentioned, low-capacity people, the second group, then your real best results are likely to be obtained by trying to improve their capacity with advice and assistance inspections, uh, investigations when something goes wrong, auditing their systems, suggesting improvements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, their problem is not their lack of good intention, it's their low capacity. Now with ill-intentioned high capacity operators, there's no way you're gonna allow these people to self-regulate because they are fairly untrustworthy. So you have to use quite intrusive regulatory systems with them. So you have to engage in things like inspections, uh, surveillance systems, design requirements. Incentives may operate with these people because of course, if you give them a financial incentive, they are well in, they are well, um, they're, high, they're of high enough capacity to reorganize their affairs, to take advantage of incentives. So the incentive may reorientate their ill intention. Um, but you would use quite different controls for these types of operator than for groups one and two. Then finally, ill intentioned low capacity operators, you would want to devote a lot of attention to them, especially if they're engaged in risky activities. Um, so you'd inspect them, you would screen entry, you would not allow these operators to engage in high risk activities. Uh, and you would have, for instance, permitting systems that allow you to keep a close eye on them if you do allow them in the industry. So the point here is that by analyzing the kind of people you're dealing with, you can decide the degree to which they are trustworthy enough for you to use low intensity, cheap methods of regulating. And that to me is one of the keys to regulating with the lowest degree of cost and intensity that you can get away with. The other thing you can overlay on this analysis, which I won't do today, is an analysis of the kinds of risk these people are involved in. Clearly, the lower the risks, the more you're likely to rely on self-regulatory systems, the higher the levels of risk, the more money uh, you would spend on more intrusive, uh, more heavy-handed regulations. Okay, now, I've been speaking so far about if you like, the general disposition of regulation, which is to only regulate where you have to, to use minimal regulation positively. Um, and I want to talk about the, the framework for delivering regulation when you have to regulate. And when I talk about regulatory activities, uh, I think it's useful to break those down into the core regulatory tasks. And it seems to me there are, there are three really big tasks that regulators have to do. They have to set their objectives. That is, a regulator has to know what it is trying to achieve. If the regulator doesn't know its objectives and the outcomes it's seeking to obtain, then it's, it's 
without a rudder it's directionless or without a compass um, the second thing is they have to deliver outcomes they have to deliver you know, aviation systems that are cost effective and safe uh, they have to deliver cleaner oceans or whatever and the third thing that regulators have to do is to meet procedural expectations that is they have to satisfy politicians and people that they are properly fair and accountable and that their, their procedures are uh, transparent as they should be. So those to me are the three key big jobs that regulators have to do. Set objectives, deliver substantive outcomes and use processes and procedures that are properly justifiable in terms of their openness, accountability and transparency. Okay, now, I'm going to argue to you that in doing these three things, the best regulators, the positive regulators, are aware, intelligent, and dynamic. Um, now, in arguing this, I am building on work that I was involved in uh, with UPenn on regulatory excellence uh, and uh, I refer you to the book by Kerry Coglinese on uh, regulatory excellence. But my distillation of that project is this, that excellent or positive regulators tend to be aware, intelligent, and dynamic. And I'll just run you through what I mean by that. Uh, being aware as a regulator means that you are aware of the challenges being faced. You are aware of your objectives, of the problems you are likely to encounter in meeting those challenges, and of the risks involved. That is, bad regulators will not be aware of the challenges. They will be hit by challenges on a daily basis. They will not be anticipating them. A good regulator will be able to map out, these are our objectives, these are the challenges, we will be uh, meeting in the forthcoming future. The good regulator will be aware of the options, that is, the array of strategic possibilities that they can use to achieve their objectives. Bad regulators will tend to just use the strategies they've always used, and they will just leap to a command and control system or whatever. Good regulators or excellent regulators will say, OK, let's look at the problem here and let us review all of the different ways that we could approach that problem. So they will be aware of the array of strategic possibilities. Awareness also will be of settings, that is, the expectations that industry and politicians have of the regulator the institutional framework and the legal framework that actually restricts or enables what they can do. So to give you an example here, bad regulators will try to do something and then they will discover that a government department won't allow them to do that after all. Or their lawyers will say, we can't do that. Uh, we don't have the legal powers to do that. If you consulted us three months ago, we'd have told you that you, we don't have the legal powers to do that. So they get taken by surprise, bad regulators. Good regulators are aware of what they can get done within their governmental, political, legal setting. So that's, that's awareness of settings. Positive regulators are intelligent. They have a, an intelligence system that makes them well-informed. They will gather the information they need to get the job done. So they will have information on things like the challenges they face, their objectives, and that will allow them to be performance sensitive. And performance sensitivity is a key aspect of excellent or positive regulation. It, Bad regulators will tend to do, try and do the best they can and hope that it is working. Good regulators 
will have a strategy and a an information system that tells them on a continuing basis whether it is working or not and it'll tell them whether they need to change their strategy when they need to change it what they need to change it to that is performance sensitivity it's a feedback loop of data that tells them whether this is working or the respects in which they need to change their game uh, the intelligence system will also underpin the the satisfying procedural expectations point by allowing the regulator to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it so with a good positive regulator when they are hauled up before some parliamentary or select committee or public inquiry they will have the information to hand that will allow them to give answers when they're when they're asked why are you doing this? Why will this work? They will have the data that allows them to give an answer to that. It'll allow them to explain themselves and what they're doing. So that's the essence of intelligence as this, this key part of positive regulation. Basically, you have to know whether it's working or not, and you have to have the data that will tell you that. And finally, Positive regulators are dynamic. That is, if they discover from their intelligence system that they need to change in certain respects, they will be able to affect those changes. You know, they will be fleet-footed, uh, like Usain Bolt was, um, and they will be able to adjust their game in order to improve it on a continuing basis. Okay, so that's awareness, intelligence, and dynamism. Um, so what we get there is, if you like, on a single page, this is the, the delivery program for process for positive regulation. So at the top of this table, we have awareness, intelligence, and dynamism. And down the y-axis, we have the three major tasks of regulation, setting objectives, delivering outcomes, and meeting procedural expectations. Um, and if you filled in these <laughs> on my screen invisible boxes, um, you would see that the positive regulator will do certain things. So I'm not going to go through all the boxes, but I'll just give an example on objectives. OK. In setting objectives, the positive regulator will be aware in the sense that they will know People have diff different people have different expectations about how they interpret their objectives. They will have an intelligence system that allows them to know what, in, what different parties or companies or politicians think about their objectives. And if they're dynamic, they will realize as regulators that these attitudes may change over time and they will adjust what they do and they will adjust their objectives in the light of that information system about expectations in the world out there about their objectives. Uh, if you, in meeting procedural expectations, positive regulators will be aware that, for instance, different kinds of company or sizes of company have different ideas about what good procedures are. Their intelligence system will tell them what those expectations are and when those messages from the intelligence system change they will be dynamic enough to adjust their procedures accordingly um, so that on one page is a kind of a delivery program for positive regulation demonstrating awareness intelligence and dynamism across these three major functions so then um, just to recap uh, and conclude, uh, what I've been suggesting to you is that positive regulation demands a, a predisposition, which is to maximise the degree to which we harness self-regulatory capacities. And largely that demands, firstly, looking for win-win, and secondly, tailoring the strategy to the target and maximizing the trust we place in trustworthy companies 
And then uh, the second element of positivity I was suggesting was a delivery framework in which good regulators, positive regulators will be aware, intelligent and dynamic in these three things, in setting objectives, delivering outcomes and meeting the procedural expectations uh, that people have of them. Okay, with that, I will um, stop talking. You'll be pleased to know. And I'll, I'll hand back to Marcia. Thank you very much, Professor Baldwin. It was uh, really enlightening. And um, I will, I have a question and to, to kickstart the Q&A Q period. Uh, in your book, um, it is uh, you both you pointed out ways of following different paths such as self-regulation, meta regulation, nudging, and so forth to reaching positive regulation. Uh, and and what I was thinking is if it is fair to say that your proposal of positive regulation would benefit from any method any regulatory method that reinforces intrinsic incentives, or would it also benefit pr from proposals uh, that combine uh, different incentives, uh, extrinsic incentives such as sanctions and social pressures, as it is the case of responsive regulation. Uh, my take on that, uh, to test with you, Professor, is, is that while responsive regulation focuses on categorizing re regulators by attitude, uh, yeah. focusing on the compliance, uh, their compliance, uh, you add to that the, the, the ability to comply as a variable that should be taken into account. So if you could uh, address this uh, question, I would very much appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think the difference between our approach of positive regulation and responsive regulation is that um, with responsive regulation, you tend to escalate up the responsive regulation pyramid. So you will start off with uh, soft, friendly compliance methods of control, and you will escalate the strategy until people come into compliance. And, and I think John Braithwaite would say, and you would go up the pyramid at different speeds, depending on who you're dealing with. Um, in our approach, we, we would say, in many circumstances, you're better off not simply escalating up the same pyramid for everybody, but saying not all companies are the same, and indeed, not all companies are engaged in the same kinds of risks. So if you identify the kinds of company you're dealing with, then straight away, you can rule out the, the use of certain methods. So for instance, you talked about incentives. Well, if you're dealing with companies that are well-intentioned but low capacity, then incentives don't work that well with them because of their low capacity. Whereas, as I said, incentives actually might quite work quite well with high capacity, ill-intentioned operators because you can reorientate people's intention with incentives. So for us, you very often get a better, more cost-effective feedback by analyzing the kinds of operator you're dealing with rather than simply going up the pyramid from the bottom for everybody. Um, and I would, I would obviously overlay what I didn't talk about much today was a risk analysis on top of that. As I just indicated briefly, um, if you analyze risks, if, if you separate risks into say low, medium and high, then the higher the level of risk, the more you would tend to use uh, high cost, high intrusion methods of regulation. Um, so I would have a, a four part breakdown of types of operator and types of risk and use that analysis to guide you on strategy rather than 
simply a responsive strategy which escalates up depending on compliance record. Um, I think that's the difference between us and, and the responsive regulation theory. Thank you, thank you. It's, that's what I, I, I got from the book. Again, it's a, it's very, very nice to read the book because it's so, it pinpoints examples and, and case points which are very clarifying. So there is a question here from uh, the, the previous uh, Attorney General of ANAC, and I will read to you. Uh, I don't know if it's available in your chat, but uh, uh, the question is, uh, how do you assess these issues in the context context of the current pandemic. The challenge of dealing with cross-border cross problems is not exactly new, but the pandemic clearly demanded and requires an unprecedented level of coordination and efficiency, both in prevention measures and in specific issues, such as the process of certification of vaccines and medicines, which is also follows, which also follows uh, strict, uh, strictly national model in the face of clearly transnational crisis. There are also aspects related to information with trans tra traditional asymmetries and the phenomenon of fake news. How do you see them all? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, no, no small set of issues there. Um, mm. But actually, this, this, this probably isn't a direct answer to that question, but the, the thought it prompts me in terms of my theory that I've been presenting today is that um, the past attorney, attorney general raises this point that very often a regulatory system that you're dealing with is not the product of one clearly identifiable national operator you may be dealing with a problem that is the result of numbers of both operators and governments stretching transnationally. And, and the problem you're having is that, let's say, there is poor provision of you know, vaccines or medicines that results from this complex of activities. And I think that is a that's a, that is a problem of application of any regulatory theory because what you have there if i say to you well it's very important to understand a the, the levels of risk you're dealing with okay you could you could analyze the levels of risk in that transnational complex arrangement and it's also very important to understand the kind of operator you're dealing with and the problem, as the question points out, is that just simply identifying the operator or mixture of activities and operators in that area is a very, very complicated task in its own right. And, and I think that is a big problem for any regulatory theory, whether it's responsive regulation or positive regulation, um, because the, the, the difficult prospect is that diff, different parts of that production or political process will respond differently to different regulatory stimuli. Um, so what works with one set of players or governments uh, may not work with another. And there's no easy answer to that. I think, I think that's just a very complex analytical problem. Um, so sorry about that. Professor, there is another question here uh, uh, from Ana Luisa Chamon. Uh, she uh, is asking, thank you very much, Professor Baldwin, for this enlightening and entertaining uh, presentation. Considering the framework for positive regulation that you proposed, do you understand it, it in the same way for national and multi-level regulation. Can you provide us ex uh, with examples that you view as positive regulation in both levels? 
Uh, I think that she's talking mostly about the internet, multi-level governance and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think the problem about identifying this model is that um, I'm not aware of more than one example of where this system has actually attempted to be operated. The, the, the example I am aware of is uh, the Irish environmental regulator uh, has operated a system based on our analysis uh, for a number of years, and they have identified certain challenges on the implementation front. They set up a team to analyze implementation. And the problem is this, I think, firstly, you say, identify the kinds of operator you're dealing with, which is central to, to my point. Um, they would say, well, how can you get information on the kind of operator you're dealing with? This has to be in the real world achievable relatively cheaply off the shelf. And the answer they came up with was essentially in looking at whether they are well-intentioned or not, you have to look at their past compliance record. And secondly, when you look at their capacity, you have to have uh, some combination of compliance record with uh, the results of your site experience, your visits to them, your assessment of the quality of management and so on. And the, se <coughs> the second problem they encountered was everything in the modern world is on websites in a, if you're going to be transparent. And <laughs> they kind of looked at uh, our theory of positive regulation. And they said, you cannot portray operators as ill-intentioned on websites because they will take you to court and sue you. Um, so what you have to come up with, I think, is firstly uh, some euphemistic phrases, not the ones I use. And I think that the phrase they came up with was not ill-intentioned or badly intentioned, but uh, less well-intentioned. That was their phrase. So if you are an operator with an absolutely horrendous compliance record, then you would simply be called less well-intentioned on that analysis. Uh, but you have to have evidence on which you can justify these assessments. Uh, and, and I think that's an implementation and problem in the modern world. Uh, and obviously that gets more difficult if you're dealing with a high number of new entrants into an industry, because if you have new entrants in an industry, you have very little data uh, yet that allows you to assess whether they're trustworthy people or not. Um, the answer to that may be that you have a screening of operations so that new operators cannot be allowed to engage in highly risky activities until the point has arrived where they have uh, convinced the regulator that they are trustworthy and capable. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is one uh, question from Jose Renato. He's a graduate student, but he's in German now in a, in a, in a uh, uh, conjunct uh, 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 research. So, uh, Jose Hanat, can you talk? Oh, yes. Yeah, can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Baldwin, for this extraordinary presentation. Uh, well, uh, so my name is Jose Hanat, I am a student from UNIB, and I'm currently pursuing a research here in Germany as a fellow of the, of the Humboldt Foundation. And uh, the main theme of my research has been artificial intelligence transparency, how to regulate it. And um, uh, this, is, this has been a tr some sort of tricky field because uh, we have to deal with artificial intelligence systems that are mostly black boxes uh, and companies, especially platforms have ar been argued that based on commercial secrecy. Um, and uh, <clears throat> have been, I mean, societies as a whole, regulators have been having a hard time uh, 
in trying to really understand what are the implications of these systems. And uh, recently we have been, uh, we have had some news about Facebook that uh, it hadn't, it had been uh, claiming that uh, he had been trying to uh, improve its algorithm so as to avoid the, the dissemination of fake news. But um, we recently knew from some documents from uh, the Wall Street Journal that the company hasn't actually been taking much uh, action towards that. And um, in this sense, uh, now directing to, to my question, how do you think uh, within the scope of policy regulations, uh, how would regulators deal with such an intense mistrust and informational un unbalance uh, and push forward this positive, successful regulation in space of such powerful companies who seem more and more unwilling to be open and, co and to cooperate? And I think that <laughs> relates a lot to the issue of trust that you have yeah. even mentioned. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, but clearly, your portrait is of very high capacity, quite ill-intentioned operators, isn't it? Uh, and the, 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 so, first of all, there's a big expertise issue here, isn't there? I mean, regulators have to be able to attract and retain people of sufficient caliber in order to, to play the, the game at the, the highest level with these operators. Um, and in regulatory terms, the question then becomes, well, what is the best way to control these very high capacity, possibly very ill-intentioned, self-serving operators. Uh, and it, one of the methods you might start to work towards would be um, systems in which there are reversals of proof. So that rather than it's the case that you, the regulator, have to come along and try and get the information that will convict them or that will prove that they are non-compliant, I think you might have to have a reversal of proof system whereby you say, okay, this is all very dangerous stuff. We are not going to allow you to do this. We're going to screen entry until you convince us yourselves that you are operating a fit and proper system. Uh, so what you have to present to us is a a bit like the, the kind of safety plan that construction companies have to produce, but rather more complicated. You have to come up with a safety plan, a system analysis that will convince us that the regime you're operating uh, is satisfactory to achieve our objectives. Uh, and you have to convince us that the the blueprint that you provide us with of this system um, accurately represents what you are doing on the ground. So it has transparency mechanisms built into it that allow us to scrutinize the underpinnings of your analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it seems that would be the way to go, which would be to rather than try and catch up um, and try and prove off one's own bat, you have to reverse the onus of proof and say, okay, convince us that you are behaving properly. And if you fail to convince us, uh, then we won't allow you. But, the, the whole, but the, 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 always the big elephant in the room is this, the whole kind of anonymity thing uh, in, uh, in the web. The degree to which you can sustain that whole uh, idea that anybody can produce anything and it's a, uh, a free exchange of information uh, will I imagine become far more difficult to sustain uh, and that governments around the world be, will be moving more towards systems that reverse the onus of proof and say enough is enough we're, we're only going to allow you to do this after you've convinced us uh, that you're operating acceptable systems. That may take some time. <laughs> but, uh, Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for your question. So the next one in line is Pedro. Uh, could you access the yeah. sound? Okay. Thank you, Professor. Professor Baldwin, again, thank you very much. It was great hearing you. 
And I have a question that it's not quite the topic of the two brothers today, but it's a, a very recent decision. And yesterday, the Brazilian Supreme Court said that the, the, a law passed by the Congress should not be considered constitutional um, because it was approving uh, certain kinds of medications against um, uh, obesity. And this is something that should be made by uh, the regulator. So for our Anvisa, that's our um, agency of health regulation. My question to you is what should be the limitations for the legislative powers of the regulator and of the legislator? Because I, I have some difficulty to understand how the Congress cannot uh, decide something. And it, because the Congress is the responsible for allowing the regulator to, to regulate. So if the Congress wants to, to regulate, it should regulate. I don't know if it makes sense, yeah. but this is my question to you. So what are the limits? of the regulator and of the legislature. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's an interesting question because in other contexts, I have looked at uh, the circumstances in which judges uh, will support the regulator's decisions and, um, and say, this is a matter for regulators to decide. And it seems to me that there are there are a number of different principles that courts, uh, Supreme Courts and others around the world um, will operate with. Sometimes they will take a highly legalistic position and they will say, OK, um, if we look at the law or the Constitution, then to, you know, who did they give this decision making power to? Um, and very often they will say, OK, well, this is clearly a matter of, let's say, civil aviation expertise. Uh, and therefore, when ANAC was given those um, functions, clearly this is absolutely centrally within their area. And so this is a job given to ANAC because nobody else is really competent. Um, so there are two things going on there. One is you decide, OK, what, who does the law give the job to? <coughs> another, another way to make it decide to decide the issue is, is it an area of special competence? And the example I gave you was an example of that, where you say, well, it will be silly if courts or governments decided matters of aviation operational safety. Clearly, you have to have a technically uh, highly expert agency to decide that. So you'd say, OK, this is Annex job because this is an area of specific aviation competence and expertise. Um, another approach, though, is the, is the legalistic one, where you simply say, OK, well, who did the, who does the Constitution or this law give this job to? Another approach is a historical approach. You say, well, who traditionally has done this job? Um, I, can't see, I can't see much in favour of that approach because uh, it seems you're far better off uh, using the administrative competence job uh, approach. But I think the real difficulty happens where there is a conflict of ways of deciding, where on the one hand, it appears to be that the law or the constitution says this body should decide it. And yet clearly this seems to be a matter within the specific competence of a particular body, another body. Um, but um, from, from my point of view, I think in cases of doubt, uh, there is a good case for applying the competence argument uh, on the assumption that we can fairly rightly assume that constitutions would want jobs to be performed by those who have 
uh, the requisite exper expertise to make decisions in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I take from the shake of his head that he's he, he's he agreed with the, <laughs> your your take on that. Very polite. Yeah. And um, uh, there is one question that I that I hadn't seen here in the chat from Ana Luisa, oh. and it's it's this one. In your speech, you stressed that when regulation drives innovation the costs are often compensated in a win-win effect. Yeah. I have recently come across information on how countries spend a significant part of GDP on compliance costs with bad regulation. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that uh, good regulation from a positive perspective could serve as an added stimulus for economic recovery, especially in the present times? Oh, yes, absolutely, because um, when I say we should be positive about regulation um, and use what I would call positive regulation, then clearly uh, what we shouldn't use is negative regulation, which is unnecessarily costly, uh, silly regulation. So, for instance, if you if you reverse my whole analysis and you can you can identify cases where Uh, for instance, uh, highly competent, well-intentioned companies uh, have to go through all sorts of red tape regulatory hoops, then clearly that is a whole bundle of unnecessary regulation. You don't need to do that. And similarly, a waste of time would be uh, using self-regulatory, self-monitoring systems on the, on the ill-intentioned sorts of company. That's a waste of time because it doesn't work. Um, so although I am generally positive about regulation, I think <coughs> we, you know, we must be very aggressive in pursuing bad regulation. And I think the way to do that is to, is to endorse the idea of only regulating where you need to, Uh, maximizing the degree you work with the grain of businesses to allow them to self-regulate where they can be trusted. Um, and, and that positive regulation is both low intrusion and low cost. So, so that would be enhancing business activity because as I, said, as I started off saying, uh, you know, good regulation is actually good for business. So Positive regulation, I would argue, you know, can be a stimulus to the, the growth we all need in the, in the post-COVID era. Um, but the, the corollary of that is that I think we have to get rid of unnecessary bad regulations uh, with the same degree of, um, of resource and resolve. And I, I don't know if you know, Professor, but recently in Brazil, there was a new... Uh, amendment to the constitution that uh, raised to the constitutional level a principle of uh, that should be there forever, I believe, but wasn't there till until this March. Um, uh, the the principle of um, um, public policies um, being uh, demanded for. Uh, 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 the, the public policies have uh, have to be an, analyzed by their results. It's a uh, it's basically what the, the, yes. the new amendment said. And um, in that regard, we recently experienced mostly because of the demands of Brazil to uh, the desires of Brazil, the desire of Brazil to get in the OCD uh, OECD. Um, the um, to uh, the the movement of, of regulatory simplification in terms of uh, in all areas, ministries and independent agencies are um, really uh, cutting off hundreds of regulations that were in place and making it more understandable for uh, the 
for everybody because even the in, the industry wasn't aware of the amount of the regulation that was in place and and this is a movement that has been taken from one year and a half from uh, at most because until that time what we had was in the uh, regulatory inflation of many yeah. hundred, of thousands and thousands and thousands of regulations that were just being added to the bulk and uh, making it almost impossible for anyone to understand the the amount of regulation that was in place in the area. I recently coordinated uh, an effort from the university that helped to consolidate the regulation of the Ministry of Health. And that uh, added up to all our codes um, uh, together um, added 1000 articles so that was the size of the consolidation of the regulations of the minister of health only on the the ministry of health not the secretaries of the ministry of the of health that are in take they are being consolidated right now so it shows the the absolute uh, absolute um, uh, lack of control that we have in brazil in terms of produce producing regulations without any kind of concern on the results and even the the assessment of impact on that those regulations uh, yeah so 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 these didn't have to go through a regulatory impact assessment process. Well, from from uh, it depends on uh, from uh, there. Uh, we had a, a general rule that was uh, uh, demanded for all the agencies, uh, uh, independent agencies. They have to go through that since a few years ago. Yeah, but all the ministries they don't they which exercise. Uh -huh. Uh, regulatory power they they never had to deal with that only recently they are de being demanded to <laughs> to apply uh, regulatory impact assessment and uh, regulatory um, results assessment as well which are oh, yes. different uh, approaches right now but even with that what some attorney generals told me uh, were, was that um, they think that there is a tendency in Brazil to make that just another step to be <laughs> taken in a formal yeah. process yeah. instead of really um, making the new regulation dependent on the uh, success of that analysis. So. Uh, uh, it is not a it's not being able to curb the enthusiasm of the regulators to produce more rules so what really makes it made a difference recently was that effort that was a mandatory effort from the, the central government the presidency that demanded all the agencies and every all the uh, ministries to simplify their uh, rules uh, with a due date, which has been postponed <laughs> since <laughs> last year. But at least uh, there are, uh, they, it's really, from what I see, it's the first time in, the, in our history that we are having this kind of um, uh, rationalization of, uh, of, of the uh, regulatory production in Brazil. Uh, have you tried a, a one in one out rule where well that 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 rule yeah that, that's uh that's uh, that's not a rule in our system although the president of anatel already uh, uh, is trying to follow that rule five uh, one in five out that was the oh, one five out the yeah. australian australian yeah. Take on that. I remember in that they, they tried that once, yeah. and and it's working because the Anatel had seven hundred and forty something resol resolutions, and that yes. doesn't count the acts, which some of them have regulatory uh, power. 
Uh, yeah. so the the resolutions were the were the important rules of the Anatel, which is the Telecommunications National uh, Telecommunications Independent Agency in Brazil. So Anatel had seven hundred forty something, and they told me that they are. Uh, uh, they are targeting to end this year with about a hundred resolutions uh, in vigor. Uh, and what I told them was that it would be better to have just one rule, consolidated rule that would yes. have all of them. Like, but uh, and they might go to uh, take that path uh, and, uh, as soon as they have that division of 100 topics that will yeah. consolidate their rules but for, it's kind of difficult to 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 understand uh, because it's 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 being consolidated in 100 areas so yeah yeah it's not actually a consolidation uh, codification or so forth but uh, or so on but um but it, it was already a big step because we ended up we, it, it diminished from 700 something 700s to 100 this year in one year and a half so it yeah. was a great effort for sure yes, it may well be that the real gain is in in signaling a change of culture exactly um, rather than because all of these one in one outs, as you indicate, they can be worked around because you can get rid of a hundred small ones and have one exactly. consolidation and all of that. So, yeah, but I think if you can, if you can change the culture where you only mm -hmm. regulate where you really have a positive outcome and you can justify that, then that's something. The Ministry of Health approved the, the consolidation on two. 2017 uh -huh. and now i'm seeing the the change of culture in proposing new rules because they have to fit in the consolidation which makes a great difference yeah. uh, before before that they just produced a new rule and nobody knew what was revoked what wasn't and 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 the the chaos helped the uh, the 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 regulator to produce even more and yeah. now they have to introduce it in a specific consolidation then it makes it uh, in and uh, it makes it more difficult for them to just produce as they desire and they have to really think about the the if it's if if it fits and if it is really getting the way. Then what I what I see is that the the consolidation helped changing the culture of the Ministry of Health in Brazil recently. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is the only ministry that have yeah. so far. Yeah. yeah. I mean, another requirement that has been suggested is that when you produce a, whatever simple rule it is. It has to be accompanied by a statement about what it is trying to achieve and uh, the measures that you could apply to assess whether it's achieving those objectives or not. And in, in some jurisdictions, the very process of doing that will have the effect that you've been talking about, which is they simply can't produce willy nilly and uh, exactly. without any sort of accountability. Uh, yeah, that that, yeah. that amendment of this year might help a lot with with exactly that because the it demands that the administration propose a rule and tests the result results afterwards. So they have to propose yeah. the rule, say yeah. uh, in advance what are the results that they expect, and that would be great. Yes, for sure. Because the, the OECD has for a long time talked about you know, ex post analysis, like revisiting <coughs> the success of regulations. And I think it's, it's been taken a long time to get started, but it is starting now, as you say. So that's interesting. Yeah.
Well, Professor Baldwin, I, I, I really appreciate, greatly appreciate your time with us today. It's really an honor to have you here with us and in this uh, moment of celebration of our uh, uh, seminars on law and regulation. Um, uh, you were certainly the most welcome person uh, to be here and, and, and to, um, um, and, and I hope that when we, we are, we are uh, back in, in a normal or at least close to normal life, we will, would be able to have you here in Brazil again, because you, your lectures and books and, and teachings are really appreciated and helpful to uh, the development of regulation and Brazil is, is opening its eyes to the importance of having uh, uh, regulations that are uh, really tailored to the ability to the uh, aptitude of the regular the regular tees and um, because so far we are we have regulations that are only concerned with bay, with a, a level model of uh, uh, of um, of regulations that perceive everybody as the same, and it's not really working. And we have lots of uh, information showing the ineptitude of that approach so far, including in the court of accounts decisions that show that less than 12% of the sanctions applied in Brazil really are charged uh, in those agencies. And that shows that a big effort is, uh, and, and money has been applied without the results that is the main, main uh, demand of this uh, constitutional amendment that we experienced this year, that we had this year. So, uh, Professor Balding, I, I give you the last words, uh, and and uh, with this uh, really uh, uh, emphasizing how wonderful it is to have to have you here today, and um, and the importance of your lecture to our students and. Uh, personnel, administrative staff, and so forth. Well, thank you very much for your, your kind words and your introduction. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to, to speak to you all, and thank you all for your attendance and for your uh, most interesting questions. Uh, I look forward to seeing you again in person in Brazil before too long. Anyway, thank you. Please enjoy the rest of the your sessions, uh, and thank goodbye. You. Bye, Professor. Bye.